Good evening and welcome to Highlights of Inauguration 1979. I'm Beryl Dakers along with Jim Welch and for the next hour we will be with you recapping some of the day's inaugural activities as well as bringing you live reports from the inaugural ball which is right now in progress at the Carolina Coliseum. It's been a very full day of inaugural activities beginning with a prayer service quite early this morning at the hour of 8.30 where dignitaries gathered together to join together and get this administration off on a good spiritual note. The most impressive ceremony, I think, however, would have to have been the inauguration itself. Wouldn't you say so, Jim? For all of South Carolina, a very historic occasion and one of reverence and great uh, joyfulness, too, because they're seeing a brand new administration coming in, and every four years it's the same excitement in store. There were probably 5,000 people on hand this afternoon around 11.30, around high noon, when uh, the administration of oaths took place. And, of course, many uh, high school bands from throughout the state that had marched in the parade came uh, during the beginning of the ceremony to take part. It was cool, I think about 40, perhaps 35 or 40 it was degrees. Cold. Quite, quite cold, but a beautiful day and just what the inaugural committee wanted, a beautiful blue sky, a clear sky, and uh, the south side of the state house, the historic uh, south side, and, and Governor Riley referred to that many times during his address. As we will see as we take a look at excerpts from the governor's address a little later in our program, right now, however, to give you a feel for the flair of the activities that went on this morning, let's see this report from Wayne Phillips. Inaugural day began early under clear blue skies and below freezing temperatures with an 8.30 prayer service at the Washington Street United Methodist Church. We invoke thy blessings upon this service and all activities of this day. And we pray that in all things that are done and said, and all commitments that are made, we may know that truly this is the day which God has made. Following the 35-minute service, Governor Riley stopped outside the church to visit with friends and well-wishers. Then it was on to South Main Street for the inaugural parade. <music> Leading off the parade was the 282nd Army Band from Fort Jackson. Outgoing Governor James Edwards and his family were the first dignitaries in the parade. As promised, former Congressman Brian Dorn's donkey, Roosevelt, made an appearance. Governor-elect Dick Riley was next, acknowledging the cheering crowds. He soon left the parade and made his way to the reviewing stand. Governor Riley was followed by Lieutenant Governor Nancy Stevenson. 32 high school, college, and military bands participated in the day's activities, including the Citadel Band and Bagpipers. History was made today as Nancy Stevenson became the first woman ever inaugurated Lieutenant Governor of South Carolina. She was given the oath of office by her husband, the Honorable Norman William Stevenson. So help me God. I now then declare you officially installed the Lieutenant Governor of South Carolina.
the state and of the United States. Her first official act was administering the oath of office to the constitutional officers. I now therefore declare you officially installed in the offices to which you have been elected. And I would like to congratulate you. Then came the highlight of the day as Richard Wilson Riley was sworn in by his father as the 87th governor of South Carolina. Place your left hand on the Bible, please, and raise your right hand and repeat. I, Richard Wilson Riley, do solemnly swear. I, Richard Wilson Riley, do solemnly swear. That I am duly qualified according to the Constitution of this state that I am duly qualified according to the Constitution of this state to exercise the duties of the office to which I have been elected. To exercise the duties of the office to which I have been elected. That I will, to the best of my ability, and that I will, to the best of my ability, discharge the duties thereof. Discharge the duties thereof. And preserve, protect, and defend. And preserve, protect, and defend the Constitution of this state the, and of the United States. The Constitution of this state and of the United States. So help me God. So help me God. I now declare you officially installed as the governor of South Carolina. Congratulations. Following the inaugural ceremonies, the newly installed officers received congratulations from well-wishers in the State House lobby. From the State House, I'm Wayne Phillips reporting. And that's the way it was a little earlier this afternoon, a little later in our program tonight. Of course, we will have actual excerpts from the governor's inaugural address. Right now, however, let's find out what's going on at the inaugural ball at the Carolina Coliseum. Here's Kay Doran. Good evening. People have been filing into this Coliseum since the doors opened at 8 o'clock to hear the music and to see some of the festivities that will occur here this evening. To start off the program, the Furman Color Guard will be first, and then the processional, and then the official opening, opening of the inaugural ball, which is the Grand March. At this time, 47 couples will march onto the floor of the Coliseum, some of these being the constitutional officers and their wives, Governor Riley and his family, Lieutenant Governor Nancy Stevenson and her family, and after this march, Governor Riley and his wife and Lieutenant Governor Nancy Stevenson and her husband will start the dancing on the floor. After they dance for a while, they will invite all to join them, and the inaugural ball is once again underway. So now we'll go back to Beryl and Jim in the studio. Well, we'll find out a little later just how well those dignitaries can dance, because after all, that's what you do at an inaugural ball. Jim, let's talk a little bit about the governor's speech itself, however. Uh, it was very much uh, like the Riley campaign to a degree. It's very people-oriented, his speech was. This entire inaugural ceremony has been people-oriented, just as the inaugural ball tonight. They're expecting perhaps five or 6,000 people, of course, many dig dignitaries and Democratic officials. But in his speech, uh, he carried forth many of the ideas and ideals that he talked about and strived for not only in his recent campaign for the office, but many times during his career as a state senator. He said, because people have been looking for a new day when government not only belongs to the people, but is the people themselves, he was not going to present a long list of promises and pledges. He was ready to discuss what he expected from the people of South Carolina in terms of hard work and good faith and of duty. And he began his address with reference to the location of the ceremonies on the south side of the historic State House. You know, we gather today on these south steps steps of this historic state house and we begin this administration looking south nothing could be more symbolic of the future because we live in times when an entire nation is looking south looking south for new spirit looking south for new energy looking south for new leadership it's a role we accept with enthusiasm in South Carolina, 
and not simply for economic and material gains which may come our way. We look forward to a reawakening of human and spiritual values. And we welcome a government built more truly upon base, upon trust and confidence in the actual people themselves. This inaugural, after all, doesn't belong to me. It belongs to the people of South Carolina. It is you through your words, your deeds, and your votes who have spoken so clearly for change, for a new way of doing things, for a new day when government not only belongs to the people, but government is the people. For that reason, I'm not here to present a long shopping list of promises and pledges. That would be both misleading and unrealistic. Instead, I'm here to discuss with you what we can expect of each other in terms of hard work and good faith, and mainly in terms of the duty that we have to each other. For my part, as your new governor, I see a duty not to provide a bigger government, but a better government. Not an all-powerful government which has all the answers, but one which is reasonable and sensible and fair. Not a government which is a problem maker, but one which is a problem solver. And in these complex and demanding days, we need a government modern and capable capable of keeping pace with the times and adapting to the changing needs of the people. That, my friends, is my duty to you. For you, I see a duty not simply to accept things as they are, a duty not simply to complain when things go wrong, but a duty to work in partnership with your government to face the challenges of the day. Governor Riley's address was people-oriented with a number of issues raised that he not only believes in, but issues that are clear favorites with the taxpayers. He said it is not a time to make more promises, but time to make good on promises long overdue. He made several major points in his address, a concern over education and a promise to develop a first-rate early public education with emphasis on a quality first grade, further encouragement of economic growth, a firm commitment to conservation of energy, an attack on the waste of human potential, and on curbing the growth of state government. Governor Riley had these remarks. While we cannot and will not sacrifice the essential needs and services of the people, we must find ways to control government's appetite for expansion. If that means tight-fisted budgets, if that means bureaucratic austerity, if that even means major governmental reform, then so be it. The time has long passed when government could spend money as if it had a charge account with the taxpayers. It cannot continue to run up bills which add bills which add to the burden of today's taxpayers and which may bankrupt later generations. As tough as a fight may be, we can win it by sharing the common and difficult job we got to perform this duty. My sixth and final point deals with public confidence in government itself. Government can function effectively only when it has the trust of the people. If it's to regain that trust in South Carolina today, I believe more strongly than ever that members of the Public Service Commission should be chosen on the basis of merit and not on the basis of politics. It's a matter of more than common sense and fairness. It's something I view as an absolute article of faith I have with the people of this state. As far as I'm concerned, the people have spoken on this issue, and I will respond with all my strength and energy and with all the resources of the governor's office, your governor's office, and you can be sure that I won't turn back until this fight is won, be it next month, the month after that, the next year, or however long it takes to produce victory for the people of South Carolina on this issue.
Let there be no question about my responsibility in that regard. I begin my administration today with the deep gratitude of one who loves South Carolina and one who loves each and every one of you. I thank you and God bless you. Governor also said as the nation looks south in the years ahead, it's going to find more than a warm climate and the chance for economic gain. It's going to find a people who accept new realities of limited natural resources, limited energy, and limited money to do the jobs ahead. He also said instead of promising to solve problems with more money and with bigger government, he would address those problems with a partnership of duties shared by the people and the government. You know, Jim, it was very interesting as we watched the ceremonies this morning. The crowd was very respectful, but they did not break in with a lot of applause until he got to those actual mm -hmm. taxpayer issues when he talked about cutting the uh, spending of government and curbing the growth of uh, government. I think those things, coupled with his suggestion that there be a merit selection of uh, public service officials. Very much so. But there were so many uh, happy faces today. And I again go to the fact of, of, of the joy each inauguration day every four years. I think they're looking forward to four good years. It's uh, economically, there's going to be a rough uh, year ahead, perhaps. but. Uh, four years to work things out. Well, it was interesting. Senator Hollings was with us earlier this evening on the 7.30 program, and he seems very encouraged by Riley's inaugural address. As a matter of fact, he himself has been drawing parallels between Riley's message and his own. He uh, seems to feel that we'll see a continuation, uh, but in a broader sense of many of the things that Fitz Hollings talked about earlier. And along that note, it's rather strange that we can look back on past inaugurals and see parallels between things uh, many of the other governors have said. Education, of course, has been uh, one of the, if not the very biggest issue for years to come. But this is the first, uh, for years past, this is the first time that uh, I've seen a governor or any state leader zero in specifically and say, we may not do the greatest things in education because there is so much to do, but you can count on one thing, and that is we will have and we will look forward to having the very best first grade, which goes back to getting things started back in the beginning, a very, very important year, the five and six year old. The first grade he's going to concentrate on money-wise. That's right. Well, we happen to have some excerpts of past inaugural addresses. Let's see if we can't compare and find some themes of commonality as we watch these reports. We make plans and establish priorities for South Carolina we must recognize those areas in which decisions cannot be postponed. Some of the principal needs requiring immediate attention are in the field of education and training. We must achieve effective coordination of education at all levels, with ample opportunities for job-oriented as well as academic training. More emphasis must be given to the expansion and orientation of graduate programs in our colleges and universities. We know that grants and other resources going to those are going to those institutions which are capable of generating modern research. We also know that industries looking to the future are gravitating toward those states which recognize this relationship. We must have new laws and new programs to keep more of our children in school. If we encourage illiteracy by ignoring this need, then we are paving the way for a welfare state. We, we can and we shall in the next four years eliminate from our government any vestige of discrimination because of race, creed, sex, religion, or any other barrier to fairness for all citizens. We pledge to minority groups no special status other than full-fledged responsibility in a government that is totally colorblind.
we can and we shall accelerate programs of industrial and agricultural development until every citizen who is underemployed has the opportunity for full employment. And every young person has a job opportunity that is productive, meaningful, and challenging. We can and we shall strengthen our law enforcement system by providing better training, better pay, and better equipment for our officers, by strengthening our laws and court procedures dealing with criminals, and by working for the removal of the root causes of crime. We live in a state that gives us a foundation on which to anticipate excitement and great opportunity. Today, South Carolina enjoys relative economic strength and considerable resources. We continue to be productive in agriculture. We have a solid base in industry. We enjoy the benefits of many God-given assets, such as our seashores and our ports and harbors, which serve as thresholds to the world economy. But most of all, we have 2.8 million men and women who still believe in giving a day's work in return for a day's pay. We have truly been given the opportunity to demonstrate America at its very best. I want to let it be known loud and clear that during the next four years, this administration will honor those working men and women of South Carolina, those producers of goods and services who are responsible for maintaining our sound economic future in America and in South Carolina. Hard work, dedication, and a resolve to create new ways of fulfilling our goals and responsibilities is a lesson of our forefathers. This will serve us well as we endeavor to reach our potential of great achievement, which will benefit generations to come. We have been watching excerpts from past inaugural ceremonies. Now back to the present. Let's find out what's going on at the Coliseum and whether or not that inaugural ball is off to a good start. Kay Doran. But he should be here moment. Festivities are a little late in getting started tonight because the governor was held up at the mansion, but he should be here momentarily. And this was the exception rather than the rule today because of all the receptions and ceremonies, they all seem to go out without an apparent hitch. Without any further ado, though, let's join the celebration on the floor of the Coliseum. At the Coliseum, of course, we've been watching the color guard proceedings, waiting on the, uh, the Grand March, which, incidentally, you know, the inaugural, inaugural committee had been planning for the Grand March to take place shortly after 9, but 
with five or six thousand people attending, with many many dignitaries from from all over coming in, including many of the stars who came in last night for the pre-inaugural gala, attending the inaugural ball tonight. It's it's got to be a joyous occasion. These are of course Furman University evening, cadets. Uh, Furman being Riley's alma mater. And here's the announcer, Bill Wheelers from Greenville. We'd like to begin this evening by presenting members of the South Carolina General Assembly. The formal processional, it precedes the Grand March and is actually the public's introduction of dignitaries present at the inaugural ball. We're watching now members of the General Assembly and their wives or husbands, as the case may be. I think they will line up and form sort of a, a cadre around the floor of the Coliseum for the actual march proceedings. Now, there's also a mix in terms of the black tie and uh, conservative business suits, and this was in, in keeping with uh, Governor Riley's pledge to, to open the inaugural ceremonies and the ball up to all of the people, because those in the, in the procession itself were in black tie and tails for the most part, but I'm sure many of the folks there are in uh, business dress. That's very interesting, Jim. The invitations themselves said black tie optional, and I imagine as we see more public participants, we'll see quite a mixture on the floor tonight. The women, however, seem to be consistently garbed in evening attire. Is there any indication, Beryl, based on past inaugural balls, uh, how, is there a time limit? Are they cut off at midnight or do they dance all night? I'm sure many parties do go on well after the midnight hour, but is there any plan tonight as far the, as the inaugural ball I until? I don't know. I believe that the ball is expected to last, uh, some, to end somewhere between 12 and 1 a.m. After the processional and after the Grand March, the, the way I understand it, Governor Riley and Mrs. Riley will have the first dance, and of course, Lieutenant Governor Stevenson and Mr. Stevenson. And then those uh, members that have come tonight that are seated in the stands, if you will, will come down onto the floor for joining in the ball itself. But at this point, they, uh, most of the 5,000, uh, 6,000 perhaps attending are seated in the stands, witnessing the dignitaries, at this point, members of the state's general assembly in the processional proceeding, preceding the Grand March. Tim, this is a departure from the program at most inaugural balls in that in the past, usually the ball has provided a full fare of entertainment. There is no entertainment per se at this occasion because it is, again, the public's chance to participate, to have a dance, to mingle socially with their elected officials. Peter Duchin, who has an international and international reputation, is uh, the star attraction, of, next to Governor Riley, of course, at the inaugural ball tonight. He also was the featured, one of the featured bands, uh, groups at the president President Carter's inaugural ceremonies in Washington just two years ago. That's right. The Duchin Band will be playing throughout the evening and during their rest periods they will of course be relieved by a local group, a local South Carolina group, the Claude Ray Band. It's been a very busy day for most of the persons we're seeing on the screen now, and yet none of them seem fatigued at all. They seem very alert and up to the task. For the inaugural committee, it's been a busy month, I'm sure, leading up to today's ceremonies and all of the activities and to last night's pre-inaugural gala. Co-chairpersons of the inaugural committee include Louise M. Hill, 
Dwight A. Holder and Samuel J. Tenenbaum. The co-chair is representing various areas of the state. Mrs. Hill is from Charleston, Mr. Holder from the Greenville area, and Mr. Tenenbaum from the Columbia area. I don't think we can say enough about the work that the inaugural committee as a whole has put into the day's activities. The of our distinguished guests. and Mr. David Olaf Peter Moltke Hansen. <laughs> Miss Ferdinand Legree Stevenson and Mr. William Montague Backer. Mr. Theodore Dowling Wiley and Miss Sarah Osborne. Mr. Hubert Daniel Riley and Miss Patrice Smith. Miss Ann Yarborough Riley and Mr. William Healy McAfee. Mr. Richard Wilson Riley Jr. and Miss Elizabeth Webster. David S. Hill and Mr. Hill. Mr. Dwight A. Holder and Mrs. Holder. Mrs. Philip L. Smith and Mr. William Talley Elliott. Mrs. John Talley and Mr. Talley. Mrs. Melvin Ernest Nunnery and Representative Melvin Ernest Nunnery. Mrs. Arvey. Mrs. 
Miss Lottie Screen Chisholm and United States Marshal Andrew James Chisholm. The Honorable Susie B. Newman and Mr. Newman. Mrs. George Bundaberg and Mr. Bundaberg. Mrs. William Estes Cathcart and Mr. Cathcart. Mrs. Theodore Allen Snyder, Jr. and Mr. Snyder. Mr. David Arnett Sanders and Mrs. Sanders. Mrs. John E. Johnston and Mr. Johnston. Mrs. Fowler. The Honorable Robert Evander McNair and Mrs. McNair. James Burroughs Edwards and Mrs. Edwards. Congressman Butler Carson Derrick and Mrs. Derrick. <laughs> Congressman John Wilson Jenrette and Mrs. Jenrette. Congressman Floyd Davidson Spence and Miss Diane Toole, Miss South Carolina. <laughs> Congressman James Robert Mann and Mrs. Mann. Senator Ernest Frederick Hollings and Mrs. Hollings. <laughs> United States Senator Strom Thurmond and Mrs. Thurmond. Lyle Carter and Mrs. Carter. <laughs> President Pro Tem of the Senate, Marion L. Gresset and Mrs. Gresset. Brian Patrick Jr. and Mrs. Patrick. The 
Honorable T. Esther Marchant and Mrs. Marchant. The Honorable Charles G. Williams and Mrs. Williams. The Honorable Earl Elias Morris, Jr. and Mrs. Morris. and Mrs. McLeod. The Honorable Brady Leslie Patterson, Jr. and Mrs. Patterson. The Honorable John T. Campbell and Mrs. Campbell. and Mr. Stevenson. You've heard it before today. Of course, Governor Dick Riley was born in Greenville County, January 2nd, 1933. He's married to the former Anne Ladies Austin and Yarborough of Florence. They have four children. The Grand March. What we We have watched the formal procession, now the actual official march of the evening, the Grand March, of course led by Governor Riley and Mrs. Riley, and followed by the Lieutenant Governor and her husband. They will be followed, of course, by the Constitutional Officers and then members of the Senate, the President Pro Tem, Senator Marion Gresset and Mrs. Gresset, the Speaker of the House, Rex Carter and Mrs. Carter, our congressional delegation, beginning with United States Senator Strom Thurmond and followed by Senator Hollings and his wife.
now, ladies and gentlemen, the ball will begin with Governor Riley and Mrs. Riley, Lieutenant Governor Stevenson and Mr. Stevenson, members of the Grand March, and Carolina Moon. ceremonies are over with for tonight and as most people here have said now the fun begins with that in mind let's go back to Beryl and Jim in the studio good evening and in just a moment we'll take a look at everybody as they get out on the dance floor but first we're going to take a look at an earlier interview that was done this afternoon from the State House reception with Hamilton Jordan the special assistant to the president Hamilton Jordan is special assistant to the president and was President Carter's representative at the inaugural ceremonies this afternoon. Mr. Jordan, how should we assess the implications of your presence here as President Carter's representative? Well, I'm here first as a representative of the president, but I uh, also consider myself a close friend of uh, Governor Riley and his family. And it's uh, an honor for us to, to be here on a, this very special day. Since Dick Riley headed the president's campaign here in South Carolina, would this seem to indicate that we might expect uh, closer cooperation with our federal government now with the Riley administration in office? Well, we've got a, we have a long-standing political relationship with Governor Riley, but it's a, it's also a personal relationship. But I don't think it'll be to the detriment of the people of South Carolina that uh, the governor and the president are, are close friends. So I think we'll have a, a good, uh, strong working relationship. In your position, having heard many inaugural addresses, such as the one we witnessed this afternoon, would you say that Riley's speech was typical, or can we feel that there were substantive suggestions made to South Carolinians? Usually, uh, usually governors or, or inaugural speeches that I have heard are either inspirational or pragmatic in terms of the, uh, the challenge they lay out. I thought Governor Riley's was both. I thought he presented a challenge uh, to the people of South Carolina to, to meet some problems, and I think he listed those problems uh, very specifically. I remember uh, early childhood development. He talked about energy. He talked about uh, other problems that are important to the people of South Carolina. So I thought it was a, an unusual speech in that it combined both uh, dimensions and that uh, are well presented. Dick Riley's theme song has been the impossible dream, and we heard him mention several topics uh, that he hopes to address that are consistent with national themes across the country. Are we moving into an era, given the fact uh, the economic conditions of our country, where really most of these things are beyond accomplishing less government but better services, uh, more education but with less money, that kind of thing? Mm. Well, it's, a, it's not easy. And I think Governor Riley said that. Uh, President Carter uh, ran on a platform of not not more government, but better government. That's what uh, that's what Governor Riley uh, said today. We've reduced the, the federal deficit by half in the two years we've been in office. Uh, it's not easy. Uh, the battles that you have to fight, the interest groups, uh, the people that uh, don't want reforms and change, but it can be done. It, uh, just as it was very difficult for Governor Riley to be elected governor and for Jimmy Carter to be elected president, those things those things can be done. So I think the people of uh, South Carolina under this new le leadership should, uh, should be confident about the future. Mr. Jordan, thank you very much. I right, enjoy being here. It was interesting throughout that Jordan seemed very anxious to establish the fact that he also considers it an honor to be here in South Carolina today, primarily because of his friendship and his respect for Dick Riley, in addition to being the president's emissary. He seemed to make that plain many times that uh, Governor Riley and President Carter very close friends, not just uh, professionally, but very close personal friends, and that that can't help do anything but good for South Carolina. One of the nice things about this inauguration was the fact that South Carolinians from all over turned out. We tried to find out exactly how they felt about the inaugural ceremonies, and let's find out. Let's talk to the man on the street. 
Thousands of people from across the state were in Columbia today to see the inaugural ceremonies and perhaps to learn a little. From Taylor's, uh, South Carolina, Greenville area, and uh, I've helped in the campaign some and uh, know quite a few of the current uh, people in the Democratic Party and wanted to come down because it is the people's inauguration, plus I wanted to have a chance to feel how it is. I'm a resident of Virginia. I wanted to see how it was to be at inauguration here in South Carolina. I'm from Charleston, and I'm a very good friend of Nancy Stevenson, so I wanted to be here to, to watch her be inaugurated. I'm from Gaston, South Carolina, and uh, I've never seen an inaugural uh, thing before. This is my uh, first one. I like this. I'm just curious for educational reasons. Why this particular one? Well, uh, I work for the government, and they said we could come down and look at this one. I had the opportunity, and I didn't want to miss it. From Greenville, South Carolina, and because one of our native Greenvillians is a good friend, we are here to celebrate with him. I'm from Greenville, South Carolina, and I came to the inauguration of Richard Riley. Why did you come here? Oh, because he is a good friend of ours, and I think he's going to make a very good governor. And I came to see our hometown man inaugurated as governor of South Carolina. We are proud of him. I worked all over the state for him to, to get elected. I'm from Anderson, South Carolina, and I came to just learn about the inauguration to see the governor. No, ma'am. I'm from Orangeburg, South Carolina, and I'm here just to take a look at everything that's happening because I've never seen an inauguration before, and I'm just interested in seeing what's going on. I'm from Greenville, South Carolina, and I came because Dick Riley's from Greenville. Ever been to an inauguration? No, I haven't. From Anderson, South Carolina, and I came with my school to see Dick Riley be inaugurated. I'm Conway, and I just came up to see the new governor inaugurated. I'm Conway, South Carolina, and I came here for this inauguration, just to see the inauguration. Or learn more history. Because Dick Riley is a very good friend of ours, and we're from Greenville, South Carolina. My husband has been re-elected for county council chairman, and that we felt like we need to be here for that reason. People from all over the state coming out to support the new administration and to participate in the inauguration activities. Jim, do you think that Riley achieved his dream of having a people's inauguration? I'm sure he did. If, if all estimates of 6,000 attending the inaugural ball tonight proved true, and there were estimates of five to 15,000, depending on <clears throat> how accurate the count was, of those attending the inaugural ceremonies today at the State House. And uh, in terms of, of being uh, people-oriented, I think Governor Riley has attracted uh, people from, from all walks of life in the state, and that's evident in those attending the pre-inaugural gala last night, those attending uh, the ceremonies today, the parade and the and the other activities as well as the ball tonight at the Coliseum. And in his uh, inaugural, inaugural address itself, he, he mentioned uh, people over and over again, that he wanted this to be a partnership between government and with the people. We had hoped to go back to the Coliseum to show you the people actually joining in the dance. However, in order to get a little bit more atmosphere, I think appropriate for a ball, the lights are out and our cameras cannot transmit in the dark. So we'll have to encourage you that it's not too late. If you want to go, we understand that they are still selling tickets on the door. And you can actually join in the inaugural ball activities, particularly since the black tie was optional. These have been our highlights from Inauguration 79. We hope you've enjoyed it. Have a good evening. Good night.